welcome to the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey podcast. I'm Lucia Kelly, expert at applied analysis and vial of anti-plastic. And I'm Talia Franks, media critic, fanfic enthusiast, and paperback with a sad ending. And we're here to talk today about Rose, the very first episode of Doctor Who to air since 1989. Rose aired on the 26th of March, 2005. Fun fact, we're recording this on the 27th of March, 2021. Woo! Well, actually, I guess it's the 28th for you. It's the 28th for me. Yeah, so <laughs> actually, we are being a bit timey one. Timey one. Yeah. Rose was written by Russell T. Davies and directed by Keith Boak. Reminder, time is not a straight line. It can twist into any shape. And as such, this is a fully spoiled podcast. We might bring things in from later in the show, the comics, the books, or even fan theories and articles. With that out of the way, the nesting consciousness is about to take over all the breast implants. So let's get in the TARDIS. Hi, everyone. It's Lucia and Talia from the future here. We're popping in to talk about something very important. Noel Clark recently came under scrutiny after his BAFTA nomination for inappropriate behavior and sexual harassment towards over 20 different women on various projects he's been involved in over the years. BAFTA have since suspended the award. As far as we know, The Guardian has covered the story almost completely, and we'll put a link to the story in our show notes. However, we warn you that the story includes interviews with several of these women who go into explicit detail about what happened to them. Please keep yourself safe. Being informed should not come at the cost of your mental health and well-being. We also want to acknowledge, since this is the season that introduces Captain Jack, that there is also a great deal of controversy around John Barrett. Years ago, it came out that Barrowman would flash various crew and cast members on set. Although these acts were performed with the intention of practical joking, cast and crew have since come out about how deeply uncomfortable this made them. As far as we know, Barrowman responded with an apology stating his remorse at the pain he had caused and his intention to do better in the future. That does not negate the fact that what he did was wrong especially because in addition to the numerous occasions of him exposing himself, he has also made transphobic remarks, which we cannot forgive at this time, but which are the lesser offence in the eyes of the public. Additionally, we want to note that despite any apologies he may have made, some of his behaviour was condoned and encouraged by others, a systemic issue that bears consideration. Furthermore, these conversations are ongoing and moving at a rapid pace, this podcast is pre-recorded due to the fact that Lucia and I can rarely meet in the same place and at the same time. For example, the first eight episodes of this podcast were recorded in March and April of 2021. Therefore, this is not the place for such conversations. We'll be linking resources to articles and other places of discussion in the show notes. That said, we both wanted to talk about this before stepping into the main body of this podcast, as we'll be talking at length about both Mickey and Captain Jack, who are both characters that we love. On this podcast, we are separating the art from the artists. While we often praise actors for their acting capabilities, that is not an endorsement of their actions off screen. We acknowledge that awful people, people we don't agree with or support, can sometimes make beautiful and worthwhile things. And the source of those creations does not negate the creation's power or importance. Every observable act of creation is a conversation between the art and the audience. We hope that you come with us as we turn that conversation towards recognizing and affirming people's experiences while still celebrating that which brings us joy. So, Rose, the episode opens on a shot of the moon, which is actually, I want to keep a record of, there are certain shots in Doctor Who that are reused a ridiculous amount. This is one of them. This opening shot is used about 10 times. So we go from the moon to England to a young girl's bedroom, and it's 7.30 and she wakes up, and here is Rose Tyler. It's bright pink room. She kisses her mum before she goes off to work. And we get lots of shots of London and we're setting the scene and she's working in a shop and looking very bored. We meet Mickey very briefly and then... Yeah, and 
And the thing is, the thing about this whole opening scene is that it feels so, it feels like it's the Rose show more mm. than the Doctor Who show. It feels very centered on Rose and on her narrative in a way that I feel like later episodes are not so domestic i guess is like yeah the word for it, is domestic which i think is hilarious because the ninth doctor is like it's domesticity it's domesticity he's frequently saying no i don't do domestic stop it with the domestics stuff like that and this is so domestic like the scene of her and mickey having mm. lunch together like the cute little kisses and the moment where she goes in to use his computer and he's, oh, that's my woman. They have those, all those sweet little moments. And like when he comes in to check on her and then she says, a mouth on right there. And you can see that they have that back and forth, that common mm. bond. And the same thing with how Rose interacts with her mother. Like mm. that, that relationship that ties her to them, to her mother and Mickey is like so there and so clear in the first few moments, but also throughout the episode. And I feel mm. like really lost later on. <laughs> in that yeah, well, I feel like this episode is doing a lot of work, right? So it's 2005. You've got the hardcore Who fans who like have been waiting on something since the 70s movie. And then you've got brand new people who have kind of heard about Doctor Who. Pardon? The 1996 movie. Sorry, 1996. I'm so sorry. I'm a fake fan. <laughs> um, so you've got all these hardcore fans who either grew up with it in the 60s or might have seen the movie doing reruns on the telly when they had nothing else to do. And there's the cultural knowledge of Doctor Who. But you've got no present fans. So this episode's doing a lot of work in order to actually bring audiences in and set up the new world. We're going to find out, not so much in this episode, because as you said, it's very Rose-centric. But I think in the second episode, when we talk about that, we really set up how both the Doctor and Doctor Who as a show has changed and what this new world means and what this revival means. So I think this episode is very much about like, we, the audience are meant to connect with Rose. Rose is the self insert. Rose is the one that we attach to. So we're finding out all about her. We're finding about her family and it's the doctor who is the stranger. It's the doctor who comes in and upsets everything and changes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And for me, I think, I I don't know to what extent I connected with Rose precisely because for me when I first encountered Doctor Who I was in high school and I at that point it was it was 20 it was 2010 2011 it was right after the 5th season wrapped that was back when Doctor Who was on Netflix so I was watching Doctor Who on Netflix and basically a week after I finished all of Ten's episodes and his specials, the fifth season dropped on Netflix. So it was like, basically, I was like, I was like so upset. I was like, I can't watch season five. What happened? <laughs> it's Doctor. And then literally a week later, it dropped on Netflix. But basically, so what happened was, and I think this also happened like during a school vacation week or something, or maybe I just wasn't doing my homework, but for whatever reason, I was able to watch all of the first four seasons of Doctor Who within a week. Wow. <laughs> so I didn't particularly connect with Rose more than I connected with Martha or Donna because I, I had all of them in one fell swoop. Yeah. Oh. Ro so Rose is meant to be 19 in this episode. I'm sorry. Billy Piper was not 19. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> They're like, she's a teenager. I'm like, she's a woman. Shut up. <laughs> like, she's a fully grown woman. Yeah. Which, uh... yeah no, but I was actually going to think the exact, uh, not the exact opposite, but like, for me, I definitely bought at least that Billy Piper, like Billy Piper didn't really feel 19 to me, I guess, but she definitely, the character of Rose 
definitely felt to me like a teenager or I guess mm. I, I, don't know, I, I was a teenager at the time so I guess past me didn't really have an opinion about it but present me does think that I don't know like Rose's like a lot of Rose's actions feel like I don't know like they don't feel exactly like a teenager but they don't exactly feel adult they don't exactly feel adult in the way that I think Donna and Martha do. Or yeah, that's true. He does. Or Clara. Or even Yaz and Ryan, who are ostensibly also 19, feel older than Rose does to me. Wait, Yaz is meant to be 19? Yaz is meant Sorry, to be Sorry, full, <laughs> full disclosure to the audience. I dropped out halfway through Matt Smith. We will address that at the time. So I only know about later seasons through osmosis. I know all about Thasman. I assumed she was older. I assumed we'd fix this fucking problem this is of the doctor trying to date 19 year olds. Yeah. So the thing is. Stop doing that. <laughs> she's older because Mandip Gill is literally like 35. But. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a lot of pent up rage right now. No, actually, Talia was just I, telling me all about the American school system, and I got a little bit pent up. So I've got a bit of that energy coming to the table right now, <laughs> but I'm so mad. Oh wait, no. Okay, I feel bad. Mandy Gill is not 35; she's 33. But still, <laughs> same difference. Jodie Whittaker, Jody Whittaker is 35. Oh no, Jodie Whittaker is 38. I don't know. I don't know why I thought 35. Anyway, the point is. People ship Thasmin because Jodie Whittaker and Amanda Gill are only five years apart, and so it makes sense to ship them together. But the Doctor is like five billion years old, and Yaz is 19. Well, actually- 19! Well, actually, no, at this point, she's probably like 20-something, especially because like she spent- like there's like- This is the whole- this is the whole freaking Twilight- thing again no he's he's so much older they're so much older unless you do unless you explicitly state hey the maturity levels are different for people of different races and eight like of species unless you explicitly say that in case of like vampire things like your maturity gets frozen at the age you are bitten or like with time lords like time lords have this long a lifespan so even though they're 900 their equivalent would be whatever whatever but if it's just no their maturity progresses in the same way that a human progresses that's not okay it's bullshit yeah, i gotta you should I, not be doing that <laughs> yeah no i gotta admit the only phasmin fix i have truly enjoyed are au's where they're either all human or yaz is also a time lord or an alien for whatever reason i ship Thasmin, but not I like i mean that. like i i kind of want it to be canon just because i want there to be gays mm. on the targets yeah but at the same time the implications of it being canon in terms of the ethics of five billion year old dating a 20 year old make me cringe so much because like i yeah. We can address that when we address it. We need to get back to episode okay. one. <laughs> Wild. So I just needed to. Just needed but now, to but now you know where we stand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like but when that comes up in six episodes and, and Jackie smacks the shit out of the doctor because that's the appropriate response, you'll know that, that one. is the appropriate response. <laughs> oh. Which brings me to my beloved, my Jackie. I adore Jackie so much. Like, I have such a big place in my heart for Jackie. I the fact that Jackie this episode... So much. The fact that this episode makes her a joke makes me so upset. It's so upset. She is a joke. We have this whole thing where they're playing on this trope of the unemployed, money-grabbing single mom living in the projects, which is just so disrespectful and so awful. And then on top of all of that, You've got this, like, there's the whole bit where she's, like, the whole, the whole flirting with the doctor bit makes my entire skin crawl. Oh my and then, like, uh. Uh, there's a way to frame 
the way that she's doing the whole, oh, your job just blew up. Let me try and make this work for you. Hey, I've lined up an interview. Hey, it turns out you can get compensation. Hey, I'm your mom. You're quote unquote an adult. You're 19, but you're played by a 24 year old. We're going to just keep going with this fantasy, right? But we live together and I care about you. So let's make this work. There's a way to do that in a way that isn't this. <laughs> And the thing about Jackie, she's pushy, but she's ultimately a supportive mom who wants her daughter to get a job because, like, she needs to do something. Exactly. Jackie is a good mom and she doesn't get credit. It's upsetting. She's a bit pushy about it, but also Rose needs to do something with her life. Exactly. Like, she raised Rose. We all love, well, there are some people who don't like Rose, but she is generally looked at as, like, a very good person and, like, a cool being. Someone raised her and that person was Jackie, so she can't be all bad. Yeah, and I just honestly don't understand why people hate on Jackie so much. And also, people don't realize, like, Jackie is also a widow who lost her husband in a fairly traumatic way. <laughs> like, right? Right? I mean, we haven't like, gotten to that Jackie's point. In, we haven't gotten there yet. We'll get there in like there yet, episodes. But it, is, but it is something that we do learn later in the season and so that people know about Jackie if people have watched through. So I don't understand. I don't know. We'll, we'll get there when we get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll, we'll get there. But speaking of implications about Rose's life that this mm. episode like dangles at us, can we talk about Derek for a sec? <laughs> Absolutely. Give me all your thoughts. Who <laughs> that when Rose is trapped in a basement, locked up with a bunch of creepy dummies, she thinks that this guy Derek is playing a trick on her. Who the fuck is Derek? He must be the office jokester. He's that really, you know what he is? He's that really annoying white guy who has no problems, so he makes himself everyone else's problem. Yeah. And he says, oh, I was just joking. And it's like, no, you, you did all this. I hope you're cleaning it up. That's who Derek is. We've pinned him down. <laughs> and I bet that's why they made his name Derek. <laughs> Apologies to all the Dereks out there. Oh, you can prove to be better. <laughs> so Rose goes downstairs. She's looking for Wilson. And all of this is shot very much like a straight horror, right? There's all of these shots that are very much like, down the long corridor and closes up on Rose's face and the lighting is very dramatic and the music is tense and we're like, oh, what's gonna happen? And then the doors slam, which by the way, there's no plastic in those doors. How did that happen? Yeah, how did that happen? <laughs> like, were the hinges made out of plastic? Did, did like, did the- They're usually made out of metal, so I don't understand. Like, there's no plastic in doors. Did That's the, not what they're made out of. Are the doors on a switch? Did the nesting consciousness somehow gain telepathic powers? Like, what's going on here? Was there, like, a secret toddler mannequin that was just out of shot and was pushing it closed? <laughs> like, we don't know. <laughs> it makes no sense. But anyway. The, How did they lock it? Exactly. It makes no sense. But anyway, the... The door's lock, And then she's like, okay, this is the worst. Please stop everything. I'm just here to give Wilson his lottery money. <laughs> the fuck? I want to go home. Why did, like, why were they attacking her? Like, I think they might have been just bored. Well, here's the thing. So we establish later that Wilson has died. So if it might be a... Wilson, why were they at Henrik's in the first place? Why did the doctor need to blow it up? I don't understand <laughs> part of the episode. I really don't. Maybe they were trying to set up a second base. We don't know. We're not told. It might be a case of, the, the, the way that I would imagine it is that it's about there being no witnesses. So if Rose finds Wilson, Rose will run and tell. So Rose also has to die and there needs to be two bodies, not just one. <laughs> so the mannequins start moving. It's all very scary. And then the first shot we get of Rose and the Doctor in the same shot is them holding hands. That's the first shot we see of them. <laughs> and my heart just like, broke a little bit. 
yeah <laughs> and then he's like run and then that's the whole thing but like that's their establishing shot and that's so emblematic of their whole relationship right is that they go through things together they hold each other's hand they comfort each other they support each other yeah so i meant to count the amount of times they hold each other's hand but i forgot yeah Actually, like they just immediately are just oh this yeah. feels comfortable and safe but this is where we start establishing that Rose is smart, right? This is where we start establishing that not only is she compassionate and good and she cares about people, she also thinks things through and we're starting to see how she could be a good companion, right? So she has the whole thing of like the doctor and Rose have this whole back and forth about they've got to be students because that's the only type of people that would get that dressed up and silly for jokes, right? And the doctor is impressed. He's like, you know what? That makes sense. Well done. You're wrong. Love and it. I love the I love the Rose Nine. Rose Nine is so much better than ten than ten Rose. I just gotta say. Yeah, yeah. Better. I know that's a controversial <laughs> opinion. I know people love ten and Rose. People are wrong. I feel like her chemistry is better with nine, which makes sense because they're the ones that actually got auditioned for chemistry testing, right? Like mm -hmm. during the audition process, that's part of it. You find out how people work well together. And yes, I understand David Tennant would also have had chemistry testing with Billy Piper. I get that. But like the dynamic was established David with Appleson. David Tennant would pass chemistry testing with literally everyone on the planet. That's the other thing too. I don't understand how this small, skinny Presbyterian dad fits <laughs> so much sex appeal in him. He's just a small sweater dad. But have you seen him with facial hair? <laughs> and that's the thing. The facial hair adds at least 10 points to his sex appeal meter. <laughs> I didn't think I was into facial hair, and then I saw David Tennant. Anyway, so there are lots of parallels, especially this episode in particular and second episode in particular. We really establish Nine as a first Doctor equivalent. If you go back and watch Hartnell, Hartnell is incredibly standoffish and demeaning towards humans. He is a grumpy old grandfather. He does not like people. It's Susan, his granddaughter, who like, the parallels are nine and one and Susan and Rose. That's the dynamic. They're rebuilding that same dynamic in the revival. So the doctor keeps referring to humans as apes. He's very angry. He's very upset. And we're going to find out later he's a war veteran with PTSD, which again gets explored much more in depth in the second episode than this one, but it's kind of like hinted at and touched upon. Yeah, and he's like, very, very recent. There's that, yeah. moment, there's that moment where he's in their apartment and he says, mm. um, what is it? Look at the ears. Yeah, yeah, he says like, not bad. I'm pretty sure that's the first time he's looked in the mirror yeah, since the he's regenerated into this edition. In and so that's so recent, and that's part of why one of my favorite fan theories about this episode is that at the end of the episode, when the Doctor leaves, and this might actually be canon, but when the Doctor leaves and, and then comes back and says, did you know it also travels in time, that he's gone in his perspective for a hundred years. Yes, this is a fan theory that from Rose's perspective, he leaves and then comes immediately back, but from his perspective, he leaves, he travels for a long time, and then comes back and tells Rose, hey, did you know it actually travels in time? Like, he comes back for Rose after traveling okay. for some long amount of time. Cool. Okay. That is an interesting theory. I had not thought of it before. And I wonder if I'm going to be vindicated by the new Big Finish episodes that are going to come out. Mm. From what I've seen, Billy Piper isn't in those, which means Rose isn't featured. And we never see nine without Rose in the show, mm. which means that Nine at some point traveled without Rose. But if that's the first time he looked in the mirror, then the only time he could have traveled without Rose is in that, is in that period. In that little period. All See? the writers don't think about Doctor Who as like intensely as we do, and they're just gonna think. Hey everyone, this is Tully from the future. Big Finish did not vindicate me, but those Ninth Doctor episodes are baller, so you should go listen to them anyway. Okay. We didn't talk about Mickey. We didn't okay, talk about yes, let's talk about Mickey. We didn't even call him to let him know that she was okay. 
he had and she right and she didn't answer her phone he had to like go find her yeah okay rose has so many communication problems she has so many she needs to learn how to communicate it's driving me insane I was going to talk about this later, but given we're like talking about her communication, let's talk about at the very end. So the whole thing's happened. Jackie's been attacked in the shopping center. They escape from the nesting consciousness's lair. They go to the alleyway. Rose initiates contact. Rose calls her mum. Jackie answers. She's fully panicking. She just wants to make sure that Rose is okay, but she's like, don't go outside. Everything's crazy. Like, I'm stressed. She's very clearly in a stressed situation. Rose laughs. I mean, Ro Rose, honey, why? <laughs> what are you doing? Okay, so this is the single best argument I have for why Rose is 19. <laughs> True. Okay. This is Only a 19-year-old would do that. <laughs> Old or younger would do that. No, actually, no. Someone mm. younger wouldn't do that because they would have, <laughs> because they would have too much respect for their parent. <laughs> it needs to be in that little window. It needs to be in that yeah, let's talk window. about. <laughs> let's talk about Mickey. Oh, okay. So let's talk about. Let's talk about. Thanks for what exactly? <laughs> oh my god! It makes me so angry. This happens twice, by the way, in the same episode of like just ships in the night miscommunication and it happens in this conversation that rose and the doctor have as they're leaving rose's apartment and rose asks a very straightforward question which is who are you that's a very straightforward question it has one answer and the doctor instead of being like i'm the doctor i'm 907 years old blah 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 blah, blah. from the <laughs> he turns around dramatic like he then like walks forward and starts on this bullshit monologue about the earth revolving through the sky that's not what she fucking asked that's not what she asked <laughs> that's not what she asked you give this like poetic like i'm the sensation of the feeling you get when you consider the earth is revolving through space screw you go off in your tatters i never want to see you again <laughs> yeah but this moment does come very so i feel like we're not sticking to the outline that we made for this episode at all but whatever it's wibbly wobbly <laughs> um, it's wibbly wobbly but we were gonna talk about our favorite and least favorite moments in the episode so i would say that my least favorite is definitely the thanks for what exactly um yeah but my what what rose answer the question because all of us are confused question rose and <laughs> fucking question what do you mean no but it's it's the the part where rose and the doctor are talking and they're having that conversation and they're talking circles around each other and Rose says, but all this plastic stuff, who else knows about it? The doctor says, no one. Rose says, what? You're on your own? The doctor says, well, who else is there? I mean, you lot, all you do is eat chips, go to bed and watch telly while all the time underneath you, there's a war going on. And Rose says, hey, start from the beginning. And like the way she says it is so small and so earnest. And she takes his hand and it's just the most pure moment in the entire fucking episode and i love it to bits <laughs> like the amount that i love that moment is just chef's kiss <laughs> i hard eyes all the emojis at that moment <laughs> i just yeah yeah Okay. The doctor gives that damn stupid answer. He leaves and Rose is like, hmm, I'm going to have to investigate this on my own. So she goes to Nikki's apartment and then she looks up searchwise.net and just puts doctor in <laughs> and bless. <laughs> bless her purely. Number two for why she's 19. <laughs> but eventually she puts in Dr. Blue Box and she um finds this website run by Clive and oh my gosh Clive 
Cla- Cla- it's so sad. It's Cla- so sad. So sad. I just, <sighs> my whole little heart. And he has that whole little family. I and- know. They're so gorgeous. They're so There's that little, the little moment where she's like, she's read about the doctor and she's a she. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> But it was like, Dad, it's one of your nutters. You, you establish their dynamics so completely and so and just, immediately. And they're just out for a nice night shopping. And then he's talking about spreadsheets, a man after my own heart, talking about budgeting and spending winter money in summer months. And the fact that he's so into this, but he's so aware of how dangerous it is. And he's not encouraging Rose to stay, to go towards the doctor. He's encouraging Rose away. He's- mm all this information to warn her away and mm. air- love the shed set the shed set is gorgeous it's got all this blue light coming through it and it's very much it looks almost like a proto tardis the way like the tardis how it was in the old who with all of the stuff in it and it's all in this sort of blue theme and it's all organized and it's got all this stuff and you even got the desk the workbench in the middle of it that acts almost like a console like everything's focused in the middle and you see Clive also kind of fills the space of this proto companion right they establish this dynamic between Rose and Clive of he is the teacher she is the student like it's already establishing all these dynamics so that when you finally do get to see the TARDIS it's oh this is already familiar and he's going through all this and like also blessed 2005 photoshop that photo does not look real (laughs) how it so doesn't look so bad So Rose comes to the conclusion that Clive is a nutter, which is very rude to Clive. But meanwhile, Mickey's been having his own little adventure. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Can we talk about the racist Nestine sympathizer? Tell me about him. Nestine sympathizer. He's not plastic. Mm. He's not plastic. That's very obviously a human. So Mm -hmm. putting out this trash bin, the trash bin that Mm -hmm. And yeah. Mickey gets replaced with a plastic person. So obviously someone has to then take the trash bin back in and bring, and then the dupl- So my theory is, so first off to explain why he's racist is because when he's putting the trash can out, he's- Yeah, looking, there's that whole little oh, eye exchange of- Exchange, like, oh, there's a black guy in my neighborhood. This is bad. Like, it's very obviously, I was picking up very racist vibes. <laughs> So that's where the racist moniker comes from. But he's obviously mm. a Nestine sympathizer because he put the bin out there. He let the bin eat Mickey. And then he, like, and then plastic Mickey is just out there and just comes back. Yeah, anyway. So I'm not arguing that he's not racist, but I'm going to put in a little alternative theory that. He had no idea that his plastic bin was part of the nesting consciousness agenda. (laughs) The nesting consciousness is obviously keeping tabs on Rose because Rose has tabs on the doctor. So the nesting consciousness is using all the plastic it can to trace her and make sure that she's trying to get as much information out of her as possible. The bin moves forward a little to as bait. Mickey goes out, he touches it, he gets eaten. The new plastic Mickey is presumably made from the bin and gets in his car or whatever. Okay. Mickey is stuck in the bin for that whole time, and the bin by itself moves from Clive Street to the London Eye, and then is disposes of Mickey there in front of the nesting consciousness. Okay. So here, <laughs> I, I think that he's a nesting sympathizer. The bin was empty. People mm-hmm. do put empty trash bins on the street. You know what? No, that's fair. Throw my idea out the bin. <laughs> the <laughs> Throw it in the bin with Mickey. <laughs> Mickey opens the bin and the bin is empty. The bin was put out there for the express purpose of eating Mickey. Okay. But yeah, Rose's head is so obviously full of all of these doctor thoughts and thinking about everything that's happening that she does not realize that her boyfriend is plastic and suddenly has speech <laughs> impediments. <laughs> 
Like, really? Because it's not only that he looks different. You can put that down to, like, that's the best technology they had at the time to make him look plastic. We are meant to suspension of disbelief. We are meant to interpret that even though to our eyes he does not look like flesh, within the universe he's meant to be. But he's also got this speech impediment thing, which is super noticeable. So she'd notice that. Yeah, no. And also, can we just say that using the nesting consciousness as having a speech impediment is kind of ableist. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, there are so many things in this episode, which is like, oh, you really are early 2000s. The, like, nouveau woke. Oh, you're trying so hard and failing so oh. mm. And this is where I think I want to talk about Nikki because, gosh, he's an interesting character. That's like, on the one hand, I'm so glad that they didn't go with, given that they cast a black man, that they didn't go with the whole, like, big buff, oh, I'm a black man, like, that whole white people writing black speech, like, that whole thing. I'm so glad they avoided all of that. I'm so glad they avoided the black angry man trope, all of that stuff, making him seem like he was some kind of gang member or whatever, like all of that. But did we have to make him, quote, quote, this is a direct quote from the show, did we have to make him this stupid lump? Rose calls him that. And he is, right? Like, he's so, he's so soft, he's so... Mickey the idiot. Right? Like, it's so far to the other side that it's kind of just as bad <laughs> yeah. like they make him so so much of an idiot so useless and also like no. Billy Piper and Noel Clark work so hard to make that chemistry between them work but if you look at it objectively Rose is so much better than Mickey and they don't match they're not a good pair like really not they they're really not. It's very, it's the big heterosexual, like, I'm a mum figure for my boyfriend thing where he's useless and almost like a toddler and a child. And we're going to talk about this more when we get to Father's Day and the whole backstory there. But they make him so useless that it not only doesn't make sense for the character itself, it makes no sense that Rose would date him. Because he's so well, beneath her. No, but it does make sense that Rose would date him. It makes so much sense to me that Rose would date him. Because she's taking advantage of him. No, because think about it. He has a full-time job. He has a car. He has a computer. And he adores her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because that's really all he is. He's his car. She's not dating him for him. She's dating him for the, his assets. Yeah. And he's, she's dating him for her, his about, computer. Yeah. And also <laughs> think about when she goes over to his house and she says, can I use your computer? He says, any excuse to get into the bedroom. Get in the bedroom. And they, have, like, they have a lot of sex and it is good sex. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, yeah. The second thing, here's my woman, kit off. And again, with the whole mummy-son dynamic where it's make me a cup of coffee only if you wash the mug, don't rinse it, because I know that's what you'll do. You should be able to trust your boyfriend to have a level of hygiene, like a single level in hygiene. <laughs> Please, do better for yourself. Which, if we look at Mickey and Rose's dynamic from this perspective of they've known each other their whole lives, it's just kind of developed this way. They don't actually match, but it feels like the right thing to do. They're in this relationship now, and they're doing all the things, but it doesn't feel real. And the way they treat each other is awful. When you actually look at it, it's like, God, that's a very messed up relationship. That's going to make me feel a whole lot better about the future that they have. Because, like, Rose pretty much immediately dumps him in every way except saying it and actually doing it, and just runs off with the doctor. Well, it makes sense because their relationship sucks and she was only using him for his car, his computer, and his dick. <laughs> so she drops him for another man who has a better car, basically. A better car, a better computer, and she's not getting any dick, but he's really cute, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. He is cute. And he also validates her and makes her feel like a fully established woman with thoughts and feelings and, like, goals and things. So that's also something that Mickey never provided. <laughs> Even the fact that, like, 
Rose has gone through this traumatic experience. She's clearly in shock. Mickey comes in and then he's like, hey, do you want to go to the pub so I can watch the rest of the game? I'm going to coat this in, I'll get you a drink. And Rose sees through it immediately. She's like, no, I know exactly what you're doing. Don't bullshit me. Plastic Mickey. They go for pizza at a fairly fancy restaurant, which doesn't seem to vibe with what the rest of the episode has established. <laughs> and then the other thing where it had to talk about their problematic relationship, she's like, oh, I'm sorry. Was I talking about me for a second? I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, oh. The fact that that doesn't actually, that doesn't wake her up. That's just, oh, Mickey's being a dick again. That that response is not far enough out yeah. of the way Mickey would usually respond. That it doesn't wake her up to the fact that he's plastic. <laughs> what does wake her up to the fact that he's plastic is that then he has a negative reaction. And then she's like, hey, is anything wrong? And she's still not woken up to it because her reaction isn't to still be upset. Her reaction is to then cater to his needs again. Oh, girl, get out of there. <laughs> the only reason she realizes she's plastic is that the doctor literally puts a big champagne cork through his skull. That's the only thing that makes her register. <laughs> because... <laughs> Because he is plastic. Because Mickey mm. Smith is written as plastic. His character is not fully fleshed out. It's just mm. not. And it's the whole thing of he just wasn't fully thought. I mean, like, maybe he was fully thought through or some. I don't, I don't even know. Do you know what I would genuinely love more? I would love if Mickey was her best friend. I like, was, she, he doesn't need to be her boyfriend. He really doesn't. It works better as a best friend dynamic. It does work if, as a best friend dynamic. It works so much better as best friend dynamic. I feel like Mickey and Rose as bros would be the best. Mm. Mickey and Rose as best friends, like, honestly, them as friends... The dynamic that they develop later once Mickey ends up grows up and they're no longer making eyes at each other in a quasi relationship and they're actually their own individual people. And I don't know mm. how much of that is actually in canon because I haven't rewatched those episodes and how much of that is just fanfic I've read of them being bros. But the way that I conceptualize the later stages of the Mickey and Rose friendship reminds me a lot of my friendships with some of my friends. And so I've always seen them as better off as friends. Yeah. So I feel like they just shouldn't have ever been in a relationship. But yeah, the doctor puts a champagne cork through Plastic Mickey's head. Everything goes to shit. <laughs> there's chaos, there's confusion. <laughs> he rips Plastic Mickey's head off. It reminded me of what I did to my Barbies when I was a kid. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, don't think that's gonna stop me. <laughs> it's like, oh my god. <laughs> anyway, they run out the back. Rose, again, showing her, like, like, she immediately pulls the fire alarm and gets everyone out. Or smashes the fire alarm, whatever. And then we see the TARDIS for the first time. Like, properly. Mm. And it's so exciting. And the way that they... Sorry, no, I was going Rose goes in and then goes out again? What? No, no, that makes sense to me. I love the way they did it because this is a fully panic moment. This is like shock, like, we don't know what's going on. My boyfriend is plastic. He's headless now. Like, let's run. Let's get out of here. She runs around. The doctor's like, hey, let's go in this tiny wooden box. And Rose very sensibly is like, Oh no, let's go out the well, door. That makes sense that she didn't go in the tiny wooden mm. box. What doesn't mm. make as much sense to me is her running out of it when she sees what's so big in there. No, but then she goes in again and she see it's like a reset. It's like, no, this is too much. No, I can't handle this. And it's, it's involuntary. She doesn't even think about it. She just gets out again. It's all happening in bullet time. And she runs around being like, no, it's very clearly a small wooden box. But the pressure's on, Mickey's after her, and she goes back in, and that's when we see it. Yeah. And, and it's so well done. So the doctor kind of runs Rose through it. He's like, this is how it is. I'm alien. This is alien. 
you are now in a sci-fi novel, get used to it. And this is my spaceship, isn't she cool? <laughs> um, and then Rose, like the doctor's being like, I'm so awesome. You're clearly so enamored by the fact that I'm an alien. And then Rose is like, my boyfriend's head is melting on the console. <laughs> Please pay attention. Yeah, so upset. And she starts crying and then he's like, what's wrong? And then she's like, he's dead. And so it's funny because like, Honestly, Rose is kind of low-key my least favorite companion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's okay. It's a safe space here. She's constantly frustrating me and annoying me. And so mm. I, like, came into this fully prepared to dislike her, but trying to keep an open mind, but also kind of disliking her. And this was the moment where I was like, okay, Rose isn't so bad. <laughs> because yeah, I, I feel like that her boyfriend is dead and I was like that is a low bar yeah <laughs> I feel like Rose starts out a lot stronger than where she ends Rose here I'm actually a door she's great she's forward thinking she's compassionate she's smart she knows what she's about she stands up for herself she's in a very weird bad relationship with her boyfriend but she's about to get out of that so it's okay but like over time her personality and her character becomes so much about the doctor and so much about her relationship to the doctor that she loses all of that mm -hmm. and it's so upsetting and frustrating <laughs> okay so mickey's head melts on the console the tardis moves to just outside the london eye on the thames and rose and the doctor have this back and forth where we're still establishing the dynamic, we're still establishing all the rules. And this is where we really start to see just how much, like, the Doctor is pretty much fresh off the battlefield, right? He is so still in the headspace of being a soldier and having been in wartime and how that all ended he's still so much in that space and yet there's still all this care right the way that the doctor's trauma is exploding out of him at every angle is just so heartbreaking because <laughs> he's trying to save this one little planet but at the same time, he's very much grieving the loss of his entire planet and all of his people. Yeah, and I gotta say, this is another argument for my thinking that there's at least a hundred years that passed in that interim. Because, so here's the thing, the reason I think it's a hundred years is because in the 50th anniversary special, the war doctor says that he's 800 years old. But... Mm -hmm. David Tennant is frequently saying that he he's 900 that he's 900 years old but that is so true but the ninth doctor is very clearly fresh off the time war so where did those mm. 100 years go cuz he did not spend 100 years with Rose so obviously mm -hmm. He was gone for 100 years during that time period. And also, mm -hmm. I think, uh, and we can get into this when we talk about the second episode versus the first episode, but the Doctor in this episode is so much harder than the Doctor in the second episode. And you see also all the props to Christopher Eccleston. The vulnerability there just under the surface is so apparent. When we get to where he and the nesting consciousness are talking and the nesting consciousness is basically saying, like, he recognizes the Doctor as a Time Lord and starts bringing up all the stuff. And Christopher Eccleston's face is just, it's just pain. It's just hurt. Like, it's so fresh and so just on it. And I'm so sad. Why do these people have to be such good actors? It hurts. <laughs> It hurts my heart. <laughs> yeah, so we meet the nesting consciousness. We have the anti-plastic. Can I just mention Mickey is alive? <laughs> Mickey is alive. We've established that he's alive. It's okay. Keep the domestics outside. Also, very quickly, this is going to go in our science section at the end, but the doctor just very nonchalantly, when Rose very reasonably is like, but wait, the body's still out there. The doctor is very hand wavy is like, oh, it melted with the head. Why would it have melted with the head? The head melted because it was on the hot console. The body was nowhere near the console. 
if you had said without the head, the body is useless or like it would have frozen or like anything like the thought, but no, we've established that the thought control can be through any body part because the arm was conscious. So even that wouldn't work. Like there's no reason for the body to melt. Yeah. And also the other thing that bothers me is if you think about to what extent the body and the head are connected if you think about later in the husbands of river song the tardis wasn't able to take off because hydroflax's head was in the tardis but his body was not mm. so how was the tardis able to take off with the head oh my god because how will we define plastic mickey is he a being is he a person or is he an object because he's plastic but he has thought control but he's only an extension of the nesting consciousness. So yeah. is he like the equivalent of a limb? Yeah, so that was the thing. I was gonna- is he, think is he a little thumb puppet with it? Like when you draw a face on your thumb and use it as a finger puppet, is that plastic Mickey? Yeah, so, that's <laughs> the thing. so like how much do the Autons have autonomy? is the thing that's something i think about are the autons is it really a hive mind or like do they have their own minds that just connect to the hot to what extent do they have agency was plastic mickey his own person because clearly he had mickey's thoughts and memories to be able to interact with rose because it also makes me think about like rory was able plastic rory was rory mm. Rory, when he was reconstituted, had all of Plastic Rory's memories. So that makes me think that Autons do have autonomy. So Plastic Mickey was his own person. So when the Doctor I was going to off and mur and melted it, he murdered someone. He sure did. <laughs> he sure did. I was going to give this episode a high science rating, and now talking it out, it no longer gets that rating. <laughs> No, there are so many holes here. I'm slightly horrified when I just realized that Plastic Mickey was his own person and just got murdered. <laughs> yeah, no. R.I.P. Plastic Mickey. Gone. I, I was actually gone. Gonna... I would say gone too soon, but you were gone just long enough. <laughs> I was actually going to say that Plastic Mickey was the Adam, so. <laughs> oh no. We haven't even explained the Adam yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. Um, that should be our subtitle. We'll get there. We'll... <laughs> <laughs> so everything at the diplomatic mission goes very, very wrong. They find out that the doctor has anti-plastic on him. The nesting consciousness panics and starts activating everything. So Jackie's gone shopping living her best life she's just got money off the police she's gonna spend it on some new clothes she's doing her best she's doing the best she can and then we see clive he's talking about his blessed budget and he gets murdered he finds out that everything's real he finds out that he wasn't a nutter that everything was real that it did exist and then, and he, then he dies immediately yeah, you see his face goes from elated to like it falls as soon as he knows that he's going to die, and then he dies, and then it just mm -hmm. breaks my heart. And actually, mm -hmm. it makes me think, why wasn't Clive part of the group of people who were in Love and Monsters? And the reason I think he wasn't part of that group is when, I think they probably tried to recruit him, and he was like, I don't want anything to do the fuck with the doctor. <laughs> that guy? He was like, no, this is a private project. I don't want to meet him. This is strictly academic. Yeah, no, like, I, I want to know about him. I don't want to be near him. I've got a wife and son. <laughs> Y'all want to do. So, this is Rose having her huge moment. She says, I've got no A-levels, no job, no future. And then she grabs an axe. And then, she, but I tell you what I have got. Jericho Street, junior school, under sevens, gymnastics team. I've got the bronze. And then she chops through the rope, holding the chain to the wall, and then runs and swings out along the side of the catwalk. And then she kicks the autons into the vat. And then the second one ends up dropping the vial of anti-plastic into the vat. And then the Nessine screams. And then there's all these yeah. special effects that aren't really that special because <laughs> they're alive, but we pretend that they are because we love the show. <laughs> and, 
And then and Jackie doesn't get killed by brides. Woohoo! Hey. <laughs> That's the real reward. But yeah, not not to squash Rose's moment, but if the last time that she did gymnastics was when she was six years old, and she's nineteen now, <laughs> I have questions. <laughs> I have questions as well. But I mean, it's a lovely moment and props to her, but, you know, when was the last time you chalked your hands, beloved? <laughs> I need to know. Yeah, but also not to underscore her moment or anything, but I also think you don't need a whole lot of gymnastics training to swing on a chain and kick someone. I mean, you need a fair amount of core strength. You, you need, need to be able to... No, you need core strength. You don't need gymnastics training. I'm saying if she kept up her core strength, like yeah. she doesn't need to chalk up her hands. She doesn't need to know how to do handsprings mm -hmm. or anything. No, where's the post credit scene where we see the doctor putting ointment and taking care of the rope burns that are on Rose's hands from having grabbed an oily maintenance rope with absolutely no preparation and swinging yeah, it across we don't a whole that state. scene because they immediately go to see the end of the world. And yeah. Rose starts talking. So the whole time that Rose is getting sunburned, she's also got these rope burns on her hands that she's being very quiet about and like, no, I bother him. <laughs> Not rope burns, like chain burns. Do we even see her mm. wash her hands? Do we see her wash her hands? Okay. I don't think we do. We don't see her wash her hands. So, oh, we don't see her wash her hands. Oh, that's so nasty. <laughs> no, like, she that's... doesn't even change. She, she doesn't, doesn't even change. She doesn't even change. No, she... Oh. Oh, no. Yeah. No. Oh, no. <laughs> also, what are bathrooms like on that spaceship? No, never mind. That's for next episode. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, now in the era of COVID, mm -hmm. I think a lot about people... Wa like, I've always thought it was weird that people never went to the bathroom or had their periods or anything in space or whatever. Mm -hmm. But now even just the baseline of when was the last time you washed time you washed your hands? Maybe we should add that as a segment of when was the last time they the washed last time you washed your hands? It's gonna be never. It's I'm just gonna be a spo sp big spoiler. Never. <laughs> gonna be never and I'm gonna be perpetually disgusted. But then also talk about crossing borders and spreading contagions. Like think about all of the various viruses and sicknesses that they could have brought from 21st century earth to the year 19 whatever that year was when they go back to see dickens and all that yeah no i sure hope the tardis has a sanitation routine i sure hope that the what? tardis is taking care of that because the doctor sure isn't <laughs> Like they're crossing all I hope the TARDIS is on top of it. Talking about unhealthy relationships, let's talk about how the TARDIS is the unspoken hero of the Doctor all the time and is quietly taking care of them. Yeah, they, <laughs> while they're... the year five billion has probably, like, I don't think they're doing vaccines for the bubonic plague there anymore. They, like, what if they come? Like... Well, none of them are from Earth except Cassandra. Yeah. So, what, what if they, what if they take, oh my goodness. Now I'm no. upset. I need to wash my goddamn hands. Is there anything else that you wanted to say that we haven't covered? The moment where the doctor is going through Rose's apartment. <laughs> and super casually. Super casually. And he just looks at the magazine and he's like, and he's like that's not going to last. He's gay and she's an alien. <laughs> and then... I want to know how he knows that. Is it the picture? Is it the article? Is that he actually knows these two figures in I, the photos? I think, was, I think he knows the two figures in the photos. I think he's like, oh, no, he's gay and not into her. And also she's an alien and like, <laughs> so in my mind, I have this whole theory of, okay, but they're, it's not going to last, but they're going to stay friends. But the thing is, is, he's gay, he's not really into women, and he's going to come out to her, and he's going to be like, oh no, I'm so sorry, like, we can't be together. And then she's like, it's okay, I'm an alien anyway, I couldn't stay on this planet long term, this was <laughs> going to be a temporary relationship, but we can still be pen pals, I'll send you digital messages from the stars, and then they- I'm going to tell you about Zoom, it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> having Zoom calls across the galaxy. And they stay Biffles. These minor, minor characters that we never even see. 
<laughs> literally the only thing we know about them are their pronouns and one sexual orientation and and, and one general species umbrella <laughs> and general species umbrellas it's implied that he's human but mm -hmm. we don't we don't know he could be a walrus we don't know he's not a great horned owl so wait so hang on so this article is actually about a very cute little friendship romance at a zoo between two different species and they're like look at this cute little heartwarming story and then the doctor looks at it as is it between a penguin and a polar bear <laughs> go check out into the archives my episode for that reference <laughs> <laughs> into the Ar that's a little plug <laughs> a fan fiction podcast <laughs> Oh, okay. Archivespod.com. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about the hero and the atom. So this is a category that we came up with to basically like who was the hero and who was who was the useless dolt, who was the worst. Big fans of the show will know who Adam is, or maybe you don't because he's so forgettable and he's only there for maybe two episodes, but you will meet him in is there for three? Th okay. Is there for three episodes, but two stories. Okay. Adam is a very, very brief, very, oh. very annoying companion. <laughs> oh, wait, no, actually, no. It is actually only two episodes. I thought the long- I thought so. I thought the long game was a two-parter, but it's only a one- No. It's a one-parter, but they go back to that set in the finale. Oh, yeah. That's what happens. It's so fun. that set is on two episodes, but yeah. the story is on one. Yeah. Spoiler alert, I have the controversial opinion that the Adam is the Adam is not the Adam of his first episode, but we'll get to that. I agree, actually. <laughs> I know who the Adam is for that one, for I sure. <laughs> No, I know who the Adam is for that one also, but we'll get- He's definitely the Adam of his second episode, which is why this category is called the Adam. <laughs> but we'll get there. But we'll the get there. Timey Wimey Podcast. We'll get there! <laughs> so, who was your hero and who was your Adam? So, the, <laughs> the hero of the episode is its titular character, Rose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rose definitely the hero. The Adam of the episode, I said I thought it might be Plastic Mickey, but I actually think it is the racist nesting sympathizer. I was tossing up between Rose and Jackie for the hero, because I feel like Jackie does a lot. Jackie's doing a lot in the background, she's not getting the appreciation she deserves, but Rose does have the big damn hero moment. Mm -hmm. She's got So, the she got the bronze, so... Rose is also the hero in my book. I am going to make Plastic Mickey the Adam. <laughs> okay. Okay. He's I'm just the worst. He got murdered. He got murked. But I guess yeah. it doesn't mean that he's not the Adam. <laughs> Many people get murked on this show. <laughs> True. That does not excuse you from being a terrible person. That's fair. <laughs> or being, or whatever. We'll get into the semantics about what constitutes a person next episode because that's super fun depends on your definition of a person oh god uh, i have a lot of feelings yeah. about next episode but we'll get there <laughs> and finally we're going to do the grading so this is a i'm gonna say it's a trope of a lot of rewatch podcasts is that people will give a grade at the end of an episode, or they'll rank them in some way, or they'll be like, so how does this compare to the rest of the show? Blah, 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 blah. However, <laughs> I have not yet come across a podcast that does this, that uses a rubric, and it drives me up the wall. You cannot grade something without a rubric. It doesn't, don't, you can't. It's not a thing. You need a rubric in order to have points, in order to assess it, in order to give it a grade, in order to do the thing. You need a rubric. You can't just go with the vibes, you can't just go with the feelings. Then it's not grading, you're just saying it's good or bad. You're just, ugh, it drives me insane. So I made a rubric. This rubric will be available. See, Lucia has very strong feelings <sighs> about this, and I just shrugged and said, okay. But this way, but this way, I think it's going to be so good because now, 
we know ex it's going to be the same system every time. It doesn't matter how we're like feeling in the moment. It's not about, well, this episode was a B, so I think this one's an A. Or I didn't really like this episode for really pedantic reasons, so that means the whole episode's bad. It's, no, thinking about it logically, analytically, objectively, this is the grade. And it's just going to make me easier in my heart. So <laughs> each episode is going to be graded upon direction, writing, acting, science, and rewatchability. And it's on a scale of one to five of basically like do better and five being you're insane and I love it. So what would you say? Yeah. yeah. No, you go. Direction, we have to say like clear direction. Does it work? with the established visual language of the show, and does it aid in the storytelling? Mm -hmm. I would give this episode... So, yeah. I would say I give this episode a five, because it establishes everything. <laughs> yeah. No, it does... There's no moment where I'm like, also, this I doesn't make sense. Direction, to be clear, also includes things like the way that shots are set up, the lighting the way the sets are set up. I love all of the sets as well. I love the way that they use the space. I love the way that each of the locations feel very real and very distinct. And all of that is in production value. And all of that works really well. So I'm cool with giving it a five. Can we preemptively give Sleep No More a one? <laughs> Sure. Sure. <laughs> we'll make a note of that. Um, writing. This was less good. We've dissected enough of this to be like, so many of these things don't make sense. <laughs> Honestly, I'd give it a 2.5. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give it a 2. <laughs> Because it, like, we've covered it all, but round like... It up, but if you want to give it a two, we can round down. Yeah. I reckon round down for these things. Because it's just, we've talked about it, right? So many of the little bits and pieces don't make sense. There are all these strands everywhere. We don't really establish how the Autons work. Pretty much all we get is that your planet is a meal and they want to eat you. Yeah, basically if like what, if we knew how the autons worked i would have been confident giving it a three or even yeah or even a four honestly but the autons make no sense i feel like there are other stories that flesh out the autons better both in the show and in the extra material but i feel like that without the extra context i struggle with it in this episode yeah yeah um and also, we've already talked about how the character, like, none of the characters are real. And of course, it's the pilot, right? Like, nothing's going to be perfect on a pilot. But none of the characters feel, apart from maybe Rose, n even the Doctor feels pretty not fully established yet. And Jackie's a bit off. Mickey is awful. <laughs> and also that whole moment with the Earth revolving and everything. It's so dramatic. Mm. And I know that it's a lot of people's favorite lines, but it just feels so extra. I would feel fine with it if that line was given different context. It's a beautiful line. It's a beautiful little moment. If that was the doctor talking to Rose about what it's like to travel in space, or this is the world I'm offering you, right? Then there would be a gorgeous line. And like, but the fact that it's an answer to the question, who are you, takes away all of that. Because that's not what she asked, and that's, like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? We've already talked about this. I don't need to get mad again. <laughs> okay, let's move on to acting. Can we give them a six for acting? <laughs> I loved the acting yeah. in this episode. Yeah. Especially, yeah. especially thinking, I'm especially thinking of when Rose is in the elevator, and she's looking at the elevator buttons, and she just raises mm -hmm. her eyebrow and is glaring at the elevator button. Like Interesting. I didn't notice that moment. Yeah, there's this moment where when she's going down in the elevator and she's just waiting and she's, and I just felt that in my soul 
of when you're in an elevator and you just want to get out of the elevator so that you can go and do what you want, what you need to do so that you can just go home and be done with your day. Because like I've had times where I worked on the top floor of a building and been in an elevator and had to go down 10 floors and it's like stopping at every floor and I'm just glaring at the elevator waiting to get to ground level. And when she was glaring and her little eyebrow raised, I was just like, chef's kiss. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So. That little mix of a glare and a smirk and the raised eyebrow. And it was just, also her eyebrows were just on point this whole episode. Like props to the makeup. It was very 2005. I loved all the fashion. I loved the way everyone was dressed. It felt so nice. Everything's very normal. I feel like. Mm -hmm in modern productions like productions that are being made now everything feels so much everything feels so much like costume like it looks like you've been dressed by someone who it's their job to dress you Mm -hmm. right whereas these ones like mickey's wearing in this one outfit he's wearing it's when rose comes in to use his computer he's wearing a gray shirt and these bright neon boxes and it's so 100 percent an at-home lounging being a couch potato outfit it's so in the moment and so just absolutely completely true yeah and i And all of their outfits are like that. All of their outfits feel true in a way that I adore. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Rose is just like, her whole aesthetic is so casual. I just love everything about her whole aesthetic. And she can't, like, when we get to episode three, like, she does dress in period clothes, and that's super nice, too. Mm -hmm. I have something to say about that. We'll talk when we get to the moment. But, yeah. Oh, my God. The fourth category is science. Which is basically, okay, I put this category in here because I get it. It's a TV show. And it's a pretty, it's a TV show that can get pretty silly. And I get that. You're dealing with sci-fi. You're dealing with pretty outlandish concepts. I don't care about your premise. I care that your premise makes sense. Does it actually make sense in the world? Did you establish how this works? Because if you didn't, then you're writing fantasy and that's not what this show is is so are we establishing whether or not something works according to the laws of earth physics or are we stop like because i mean like they're traveling through space and time no it's yeah no and this is why i want to be very clear it's not about would this happen in the real world because we're talking about a police box that can travel through time and space that's not the question <laughs> it's a fun space and time box not a police box yeah Okay. But within the context of the world, did you establish the rules? Does it make sense? For instance, when I was talking before about like the head melt, the body melted with the head, that makes no sense, right? It makes no sense, which is why it's getting such a low grade in science (laughs) because so much of the science is not established. It's not grounded in any way, shape or form. I don't care if you say that the nesting... Someone can get eaten by a trash can and duplicated. (laughs) Exactly. Honestly, like, I'm okay with that. I'm willing to go on that journey with you. But don't be dumb about it. I feel like this episode was very dumb about it, which was upsetting and annoying. (laughs) So I'm posting between a two and a three for this one. A three? A three? Okay. We'll be kind. Well, we were mean when it came to writing, so I feel like we should be nice when it comes to science. Okay. I would give this a 4.5 for rewatchability. Yeah, yeah. I'll give it a 4. This section, rewatchability, was originally labeled fun, but then I thought about it, and Doctor Who is not always fun. Doctor Who is sometimes heart-wrenching and emotional and leaves you devastated and weeping on the floor. The depths that this show goes to, this wasn't a good episode for showing that. We're going to be getting into some very big episodes, but the range of this show is incredible. And so even though, and also this will be the time to say that I have a very, um, like, We're not there yet, but there's an episode in season three called Blink, 
which is beautiful and amazing and spectacular. And in that episode, one of the characters says, one of her friends is like, why do you like sad things? And she responds, it's happiness for deep people. I watched that when I was 12 and I just absorbed that into my entire personality. I have a very complicated relationship with sad things. <laughs> I like sad things, but I like sad things, but I have trouble with scary things. So I don't mm. really rewatch Blink very often. I love Blink, but I don't watch it very often. Also, in terms of rewatchability, there are a few episodes that are going to be really painful for me to rewatch mm. and that I am not looking forward to. There's two episodes of Doctor Who that I have only seen once and one episode that I have only seen twice that is actually in this season. Ooh. I hate Father's Day. <laughs> I've only seen it twice and I've seen little clips of it. Like, I've seen bits and pieces of it because I've done rewatches with people where they've watched it and I've been in and out of the room to make sure that they were paying attention, but I haven't watched it with them. Like, when my dad was watching it, he was watching it in the living room and I was in the kitchen, so I heard little pieces of it, but I didn't watch it with him. I am so excited to talk about Wildest Day. This well, is going to be not, fun. I'm not looking forward to watching it because I hate that episode. <laughs> In the other two episodes that I've only seen once is I've only seen Midnight once. <gasps> I'm also excited to talk about Midnight. <laughs> um, and I've only seen Sleep No More once. Yeah, okay. That's fair. <laughs> but, yeah. Can't stand Father's Day. <laughs> Interesting. And Midnight is fucking terrifying. I cannot wait to talk about Midnight. Okay, so I've done the math. And drum roll. There we go. Rose got a B minus. Oh. Which is pretty good. Solid. I feel like it's solid. I feel like that's accurate. A B minus. Yeah, we'll we'll have to see how high of a grade the season gets. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing to keep in mind is that which is why a grading system is important. Because <laughs> This show is going to get so exponentially better than the first season. Like the first season in many ways does not show the true heights to which this show can get to. This has been the Wibbly Wobbly Timey Wimey Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this adventure with us through space and time. If you'd like to find us elsewhere on the internet, we are on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram as at WibblyPod. You can also find out more information about us and our content on wibblywobblytimeywimey.net and full transcripts for episodes at wibblywobblytimeywimey.net slash transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch, you can send us an email at wibblywobblytimeywimeypod at gmail.com. That's all for now. Catch you in the time vortex.